people are saying that he was warning everyone of the bridge about to collapse. But we also have an interview next with Tracy, who is an important part of the uh, DOT in West Virginia. And he knows quite a bit about the bridge and the collapse and safety regulations uh, following the collapse. So let's see what he has to say now. Hi, everyone. I am here with Tracy W. Brown, who is a state bridge engineer and he in uh, West Virginia Department of Transportation. And he knows quite a bit about our bridge collapse, uh, the Silver Bridge collapse. And we are interested in hearing what he has to say. Hi, Terry. Uh, hi, Tracy. Thank you for coming on. Well, it's nice to be with you. Nice to have an opportunity to, to talk about this tragedy that hopefully a lot of people involved in transportation can learn a lot from. Right. So uh, we know the story. Um, I've, I've, I've given everyone the rundown of, you know, what happened, but I kind of wanted to hear from you. Can you describe that flaw in the I-bar and how the bridge collapse actually happened? Yeah, actually, it was an I-bar on the upstream I-bar chain. Uh, and there was two towers, one on West Virginia side, one on the Ohio side. So this was past the Ohio Tower towards the Ohio shoreline. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different theories. They've, they investigated that bridge a whole lot, as you can imagine, the National Transportation Safety Board, and FHWA, and the state of West Virginia, the state of Ohio. Uh, a lot of people think it was a, a flaw that came from the foundry, you know, maybe a piece of uh, an inclusion, what we call, you know, non metallurgical metallurgical material. Of course, it was built in 1928, so the... QAQC process for steel manufacturing was a fun it is today, but uh, there was a, more or less a crack that was an eighth inch or less in an eye bar that uh, over time uh, opened up. And and it, I think I sent you a picture of the actual eye bar that fell. You know, on one side, it it's a straight line, just like you cut it with a with a knife or something. And I believe that was the side that, you know, probably opened up, uh, you know, and then uh, and then once that gave loose, the other side is more jagged, which was more of a ductile failure. So so I'm thinking probably that the eye bore, you know, actually fractured due to that inclusion. And then over time, it just ripped, ripped loose. Can you describe the, the aftermath of what of after you know after the collapse and there's chaos and then the weeks leading after that yeah yeah it was very chaotic and i used to i asked there was a guy I used to work for when i when i first got out of school that that worked at, here at the west virginia department of transportation when that happened he started in 56 so he would have been here 10 years i used to pick his brain all the time and i said well it was a white guy working there you know well what was it like when that happened? He said, he said it was the right place to work at that time. And when he said that I was wanting more information, you know, I was wanting details, but then as the years have gone by and I think about it, he, he probably said all he needed to say is rough time. And, you know, you can imagine this was, you know, 1967, here in West Virginia, most of our interstates, early interstates, were being built about that time. Uh, the earliest sections of our interstates. So this was a U.S. route, U.S. Route 35, and it was basically the interstate of its day. And they actually called the Silver Bridge uh, the gateway to the Midwest and uh, and the gateway to the South, you know, if you're coming from the Midwest, and it was a heavily travel truck route, you know, people going back and forth through, uh, you know, different states and things. And and so you can imagine once you sever that link, it, you know, it, it's hurting not only people trying to get from one side of the river to the other for work and to visit family and friends, but it's 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 disrupting commerce too. And, and uh, so they were routing traffic off of US 35, from my understanding, as far west as Chillicothe, Ohio, and as far to the east as here in Charleston, where I'm at. So, you know, 
getting that many vehicles a day, you know, trying to move through and, and things. And, and so you had to bridge close for two years before the new one was built. And uh, they had a, they ran a ferry boat for a while. Goodyear uh, had a, had a resin plant down there on the West Virginia side, just south of Point Pleasant, downstream from the Silver Bridge. And they ran a ferry boat for a little while, uh, actually ran a railroad before that, uh, a dedicated uh, uh, commuter line until they could get the uh, 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 the uh, river docks built for the ferry boat. So they, then they ran the ferry boat you know, to my understanding, until the new Silver Memorial Bridge was built. It's just crazy to me how it's, one, such a tragedy with the casualties that actually took place when the, it actually collapsed, and then the upending of daily life and commerce and, you know, freight afterwards because it was such an important bridge and it took, you know, two years to fix. But it's interesting to see the different ways that they you know, would co go around it, you know, how to how to kind of keep life normal. And the bridge wasn't known as a bad bridge at this, you know, until it fell. I thought nobody, nobody really thought a whole lot about it. It swayed and, and things like that. But based on its design, people were used to it. It always did that. So nobody can imagine it would have fallen. But, uh, yeah, they... they uh, they went through a lot out there, and, and every day that we come to work, I always tell, you know, our folks, you know, especially our bridge safety inspectors, you know, it's a tough job going up inspecting these bridges in all kinds of weather. The traffic's horrendous. Usually that's what's mostly the dangerous thing that they can face is the traffic. But I said it's hard because it's worth it. You know, we're doing this for a reason, to prevent that from, from happening, you know, to help prevent it from ever happening again. Uh, you, you don't want anybody to even have to think about how safe a bridge is while they're, while they're crossing. Yeah, it, exactly. And that, that brings me to my next question. How, how did this change safety in bridges um, it, for Virginia and in the U.S. in general, but also why this specifically did it, it make such a difference? Before Silver Bridge fell, we were mostly inspecting bridges with a, with a mindset of what kind of maintenance needs does this bridge have? You know, they would go down, you know, and, and maybe it was somebody that was, you know, doing something completely different, maybe uh, running a piece of equipment the day before, but they said, well, you're going in this area, look into Silver Bridge while you're there and see what, what's wrong with it. And they would write down, well, you know, this has got some surface rust, you know, it needs cleaned and spot painted and maybe expansion joint leaking and things like that. But then when the silver bridge fell, uh, it all became about safety. Safety is paramount. Safety is number one. So it got all the states and the U.S. territories and jurisdictions all on the same page. It standardized what a bridge inspection was, what that term meant. And it, uh, you know, required the bridge safety inspectors to have certain credentials, certain training, meet certain standards, and then uh, and it also required you know run out of the gate that the bridges or that the states uh, inventory their bridges, keep an inventory of all bridges and the data, you know, based on their condition and their geometry and and so forth, uh, and and it's federal data that we submit every year on a yearly basis. It kind of just brought in perspective the gravity of the situation, it seems like, of how important safety is and not just, you know, not just like a quick overview, but really, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty to make sure things are safe. Yeah, and of course, you know, for my life, I remember going through Point Pleasant the first time we were going on a family vacation. I was a little kid, uh, pretty young, and, and my dad said, uh, this is where the bridge fell, and you know, all those people got killed. Forty-six folks got killed here, and you know, I thought, "Wow!" You know, as a kid, how can that happen? But I think looking back, and I, you know, of course, I'm trying not to speak for the people, you know, that that experienced life before Silver Bridge. Uh, but but I believe, you know, there was kind of a mindset of 
you know, it's never happened before. So it wasn't on anybody's uh, front burner, so to speak, until it happened. Uh, and, you know, the infrastructure was getting older by that point. And, uh, you know, prior to that, you know, even the Silver Bridge built in 1928, you know, what was it, 41 uh, or 39 years old, I guess, uh, you know, when it fell. So it really wasn't an old bridge, but our infrastructure as it got older, you know, I think the effort to focus on what could happen, and unfortunately it had to happen for for people to, to realize that and right. come to terms with it. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, that's how a lot of change happens. <laughs> yeah. On to a lighter note, um, can you tell us a little bit about how the Silver Bridge became um, an, an American Society of Civil Engineers National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark? And what exactly does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's uh, ASCE, which is American Society of Civil Engineers, has a landmark program, and, it, and it's really to uh, highlight and put the spotlight on on civil engineering uh, landmarks that, you know, maybe are a good example of, uh, you know, something that, uh, that, 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 you know, a group of people achieved at some point as civil engineers or, or something that you never want to forget. And, and most of these landmarks are, you know, things like the Hoover Dam and, and you know, things like that. Uh, we got a suspension bridge here in West Virginia that's a civil engineering landmark, and they can be state or national historic landmarks. So the ASC president here in our, our local area here in West Virginia approached me about, said, would I, would I support that? And I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I hadn't heard of it until that, that time that they had this program. So we put some documentation together and got our governor and speaker of the house here and 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 our senate president to all support it the mayor of point pleasant and 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 some of the locals in that area down there to you know write letters to support and so we've got went before a nomination committee and a, and a passed unanimously which i was very thankful for i, I for what i understand you know sometimes you know there's split votes on that that but but once I found out what it was, and 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 you know they had my support a hundred percent because you know as new generations come and and older generations retire and, and so forth, you don't want anybody to have to relearn this uh, lesson by having to go through it again. You know it's happened once, and and so you want people, future generations, to remember this and to remember how important it is. Uh, I go back to. You know, the guy that I was telling you that worked here when it happened, when I first started working for him, um, he gave me a picture of the Silver Bridge, and it, it wasn't anything fancy. It was just something printed out with a thumbtack throw. But he said, uh, and, and it was a picture of the Silver Bridge lying in the, in the river. And uh, he said, hang this on your wall uh, so you can look at it every once in a while. He said, he said, if you ever get to a Friday evening and you want to take a shortcut to get home early for the weekend, he said, look at that picture and said, just remember, there's no shortcuts. It takes time. You don't tell it how much time you're going to spend on a certain situation when it comes to bridges. The bridges or the design or whatever you're working on tells you how much effort and time you need to pay to it. So, so that was a lesson to me that, that you know, what he went through, you know, he passed it on to me, and, and I felt like it's been my duty, and, and other folks here feel that way, too, that, that we need to pass that on to future generations. Uh, you know, how important the work they do is and how due diligence needs to be paid, and, and uh, you know, so, so they don't have to learn the mistake the hard way. I was going to ask, is is that cause, because I know that you've been, you know, kind of an advocate for, you know, safety and, and you've been focused specifically. I mean, you're an expert on the Silver Bridge collapse. Is that what inspired you to kind of focus on this? It kind of showed me that, uh, you know, bridges are important. We rely on bridges. That's what I tell like our inspectors and our designers and, and so forth. I said, uh, 
you know, if you stop at the convenience store to get gas on your way home, look around because everybody there is across at least one bridge. If you're in a supermarket or grocery store, everybody there's relied on at least one bridge more or less to get there. Probably most most cases multiple bridges. So the safety of those bridges is important. You know, we can kind of take them for granted as a society. And to be honest with you, if you're a uh, a citizen not involved in bridges in your jaw, you should never think about them. You know, you may look at them and think, well, it's a pretty bridge, but you should never think, was this bridge safe or is it not safe? I mean, if we do our jobs as bridge professionals, engineers, technicians, inspectors, and so forth, uh, nobody will be thinking about bridges. They'll just cross them and use them, and they'll be they'll make their lives better and more convenient. But but if you you know even if you get in a situation where our inspections are pretty robust and they'll catch you know critical deficiencies that you know, we can kind of gauge or quantify how safe a bridge is, and we'll close a bridge before we put anybody on an unsafe bridge. And uh, But when you take a bridge offline, especially if it's in a in, in a urban setting uh, or even a rural setting, you know, you could detour traffic 70 miles or more uh, to get around that, and, and everybody notices that. So we depend on bridges, and, and, and because we depend on them so much, uh, you know, they need to be safe for everybody. Yeah, I'm now putting in perspective. So I live in uh, on the Jersey Shore and um, I live on the mainland, but I have to go to the island like uh, like a couple times a week. And I we I mean, we only have one way to get to the island. There's that bridge and that bridge is it. And yeah, you definitely take it for granted because we, they replaced it. And it took, it was a seven year project and we were all so like, can they hurry this up? Like, this is like a disaster. You know, they're doing construction in the summertime because that's when it's warm out where they can actually do construction. But that's when our tourism like spikes up. So we're all just like complaining about this. But in hindsight, it's like, no, like they, they need to, yeah, take their time and, and make sure everything's safe. I can't even imagine if that bridge was gone, what we would do. Yeah. Yeah, it's a life changer, and and a lot of times now, which is a small, it, you know, I truly believe it's a small percentage of the people, but but if you hold them up thirty seconds, go off somewhere, they let you know about it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but the, the vocal people are, are, I don't think the majority. You know, most people, I think, hopefully appreciate what these guys do and these ladies do to to keep them safe. You know, I mean, we can't lose lose track of that it's, that's the reason we're there is to to maintain that bridge or roadway or whatever we're working on to the you know to make sure it's there for people to safely use and this service to right so can, I, so i know that there were sister bridge sister bridges to the silver bridge that were identical so what happened to them afterwards did did any, you know, um, faults, were, were any faults found? Did they have to take extra precautions with those bridges? Yeah, it's interesting. We had a bridge, uh, you know, it was around 80 miles upstream, uh, and it crossed Ohio River, too, in the, in the state of Ohio. Uh, we called it the High Carpenter Bridge, and High Carpenter was a, a guy's name that ran a ferry boat there years ago before the bridge was built, I believe. And, and so they built this bridge, uh, it was, I believe, built the year after Silver Bridge, maybe. I'm not sure about that, but uh, I think it came a little bit after. And uh, so they call it the High Carpenter Bridge, and it spanned from St. Mary's, West Virginia, into Newport, Ohio. And it was an identical bridge. only difference was, I think, uh, it had an approach span that was a little bit different because there was an island there, and you went across, and you could turn right getting on the bridge and go down to this island. And that part of that structure is still there that goes down to the island. We've recently renovated it, but, but, uh, but they, uh, uh, when Silver Bridge happened, this was an identical I-bar style type bridge. And, and, and so they shut it down. And at that time we were building I-77, Interstate 77. And it, it's, uh, I'm going to say 20, 30 miles downstream, uh, and and they were in the process of constructing that bridge over Ohio River, 
and they had a little bit of work to do, like guardrail and finish up work. You know, the bridge was mostly complete, and they kind of rushed that along as quick as they could, and they shut down the High Carpenter Bridge. And so around 1974, they dismantled this bridge, and, and, and from what I can gather, they sent those eye bars off for testing to see what kind of flaws they could find in those. But when the results came in, they got destroyed. And, uh, and the thinking was that at the time, and I understand this as bad as it is, it would be interesting to know that, you know, the leadership at the time thought, well, what good can come out of knowing these results? Uh, we either just tore down a perfectly good bridge or we have people on a safe bridge. And either way, it was kind of bad news. So, so I don't know that anybody ever knew the results of those I-4 tests wow. done on our and there's another bridge that was built similar to this uh, with the same design concepts in Florianapolis, Brazil, southern Brazil. And uh, one of my coworkers actually, he was down there on vacation here a few months ago uh, for a trip and sent pictures back of, of that bridge. But, uh, but it was a sister bridge, and it's still there, and they've renovated it. And to my understanding, they, you know, they've, they've retrofitted those eyeballs They've either put additional eyebars in to make it more structurally redundant, to where you know you'd have other low pass if one were to fail, or maybe they use cables. I'm not really sure. I never never went back and checked, but but it's still in service and it was shut down, you know, to traffic for a long time. But the, from my understanding, this renovation is open to traffic, and it's in you know, South America. Well, I mean, I can't imagine being, you know, a working on that bridge or, or, or having anything related to that bridge right after the silver bridge collapsed i would i, I mean closing it i def would assume is a, a definitely a good uh, decision yeah i know like when events like that happen you know sometimes like uh, you know like minneapolis when when that bridge collapsed you know of course it had its own own set of, of issues but uh you know everybody kind of got nervous about dag trusses and and so we inspected all of ours you know which we do anyhow but we went out and took a special look at them to make sure that that particular thing that went wrong with that one augusta plate we didn't have any issues here and, and we didn't but uh you know it, it's uh our, our inspection program now uh we've got non-destructive testing methods and and these inspectors go through, you know, all kinds of training, and and it's not just training that you get done with, and and you, you know, work the rest of your career. You've got to take got you know training periodically throughout your career, so they got to stay up to date on this. And I think you know most problems, you know, we find problems sometimes, and, and likely the inspection program allows us to catch those problems early enough that we can do something about it. Well, I'm running out of time here, but I do just want to ask one important question that I think, I mean, it's at least been on my mind. I know we've seen a lot of things happening in transportation, but mostly related to infrastructure. Some, I don't want to say disasters, some are disasters, um, some incidents. Um, a lot of stuff is related to infrastructure in the United States. I mean, it, it happens all over the world. But in the U.S., how can we change the way we handle infrastructure in, uh, to be safer, you know, to kind of prevent these these things from happening? Yeah, I think for a long time, uh, our issue was funding. You know, it was like you were, you were having all these needs and you never had the funding to keep up. And now a lot of the funding has broken loose and we're able to spend that. And I think... I think the key to it is, is, you know, instead of building these multi-million dollar bridges and walking away and letting it age and then replacing it 50 to 75 years later, uh, you know, treat them like we do the Brooklyn Bridge or Golden Gate Bridge or our New River Bridge Bridge here in West Virginia, you know, maintain it. You know, they're just like a person. You know, if a person doesn't maintain themselves and doesn't take care of themselves, We'll start having health problems later on that's going to become more and more and more severe and more and more costly to treat. But if you've got a good bridge, 
you can do a little bit of work, how much and all, and a little bit of work and keep that fridge good. And and I think that's what we need to do. I mean, it, it's cost effective, the most cost effective thing, and those taxpayers have a lot of investment in our infrastructure. And I think that's that's fair to them to to keep our good bridges good and not let them get down that deployment. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely a great sentiment that we can, you know, think of for highways, you know, railroads, all, all of that. I think that's that's yeah. a good strategy to have. Um, but that is all the time I have for today. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with me. Oh, you're very welcome. Very welcome. It's a privilege to be here. And, and I thank you for, uh, you know, giving me an opportunity to talk about Silver Bridge because you never know when somebody may hear it and it may mean something to them. Mm -hmm. and, and help, help down the road. Well, we appreciate all the work you do in, in driving that safety, you know, regulations further and, and making sure that everyone's safe while, you know, being able to get on with their days. <laughs> well, I truly appreciate that. Thank you a lot. All right. Well, I will end today with our unfortunately not so fun fact of the day. Today actually marks the anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, causing one of the worst ecological disasters of history. You can check out FreightWaves.com for more information about that. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. You can follow me on Twitter at Jake O'Briel to see what else we have going on at FreightWaves Classics. And you can email me at bjakel at FreightWaves.com. Tune in in two weeks for our next episode uh, on FreightWaves TV or listen to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Mm -hmm.